morning, church, those of you gathered here this morning, and those of you joining us from home, perhaps for the first time. Thank you for doing so. It's great to have you with us for this service that we call Lessons and Carols, or also the other name we have for it is The Christmas Story in Word and Song. Uh, we are going to hear a number of readings from Scripture, and we will sing carols. Now, the words for the readings and for the carols will not be on your screen today. So uh, I hope that you got a copy of this from Marilyn and that you printed it off so that you can join the, uh, the singers and musicians as we, as we have our, our Christmas carols. Let us prepare our hearts now to worship the living God who's promised to be present with us as we gather in Jesus' name. We'll now have our scripture sentence and our opening prayer. Mary said, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to his word. Blessed are you, sovereign God of all. To you be praise and glory forever. In your tender compassion, the dawn from on high is breaking upon us to dispel the lingering shadows of night. As we look for your coming among us this day, open our eyes to behold your presence and strengthen our hands to do your will, that the world may rejoice and give you praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'd like to talk a little bit today about love, which is our fourth Advent candle that we're going to, uh, to light today. And to do that, I wanted to chat a little bit about creches or nativity scenes. I wonder if during this season of Advent and Christmas, if you've seen a nativity scene. Um, we have one here out front at St. John's Ida, and I know Omimi has one as well, Christchurch Omimi, exterior ones made of wood. And they're figures that tell the story of the first Christmas. They're kind of um, a family snapshot or um, a snapshot of the whole class at school where encapsulated in that picture or in those figures is the whole story of the very first Christmas. 
And it seems as though St. Francis of Assisi, who lived in what we call Italy now, about ooh, 800 years ago or so, was the person who thought nativity scenes should be much as they depicting the story in St. Luke that we hear of Jesus' birth. Apparently, prior to the time of uh, St. Francis, um, the manger and the stable and some of the characters in the Christmas story were bejeweled and, and um, wearing rich clothes and so on. And St. Francis changed the nativity scene. He pulled the images of humility and simplicity that St. Luke talks about in his gospel, about Jesus being um, put in a manger, born in a manger, a trough for animals, and um, wrapped in swaddling clothes. He really felt that that was how we would best understand what the gift of Jesus is, that God, God gives us in Jesus, if we, if we had a sense of that humility, that God on high became so small and so, and so humble for us for, in giving his life for us. And so I've brought a, um, a nativity scene. Another thing about them is they're different all over the world. There seems to be something um, distinctive about nativity scenes. This one is, um, is from Belize. Peter and I, a, f a few years ago, went to Belize with Andy and Maureen, and we picked this one up there. And it has some, um, some lovely South American fabric over all the characters in the very first Christmas day. And um, Laura is going to put on the screen some other nativity scenes from other parts of the world so that you can see how unique they are and that God's love stretches all over the world. And so let's go to our reading for today that is anchored in God's love for the whole world. This is from the Gospel of John, the third chapter. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son his one and only Son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed by believing in him. Anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his Son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind Son of God when introduced to him. This is the crisis we're in. God light streamed into the world but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it. 
fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light, so the work can be seen for the God work it is. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus shows us God's perfect love. He is God's perfect love in human form. Those who believe in him and live in him live in love. Love transforms and perfects all things. It never ends. We light this candle today to remind us that God is love. We thank God for the hope he gives us, for the peace he's he bestows on us for the joy he pours into our hearts and for the love that redeems us and shows us the way. And so we'll light our candles, including our, our fourth candle for love. Let us pray. O God of love, Emmanuel, send your light into our hearts at this time. Help us to be ready for the time of Christ's appearing. Grant that we may so dwell in him that his perfect love fills our entire being. Make our worship a time in which we celebrate your love so that we are made ready to show that same love to the whole world, both today and forevermore. Amen. We are going to hear 11 lessons from the Bible. And by the way, uh, this is from Eugene Peterson's uh, rendering of the Bible. So some of the expressions and some of the words uh, might seem a little, uh, well, be different from what you're used to hearing if you're used to hearing it from the King James Version, say. Um, but anyway, we hope that it will be a, a fresh reading of God's Word and, and that we will hear it with fresh ears and perhaps in a new way. So we're going to hear 11 lessons from the Bible beginning at the beginning in Genesis and ending in the Gospels with John's account of the significance of Jesus' birth. This is our story, the story that gives our life uh, shape and meaning. While some in our world believe that we are here as a product of chance on this rock, that we call Earth, hurtling through space on our way to oblivion, to nothingness, we tell a different story of our origins, our place in the world, and our destiny. As a community learning to follow Jesus, we enter into a new way of living in the world. We are learning to live by a different story than the story the world offers us. We are learning to live by God's story that tells us of God's great love for his wayward creatures.
God created a good world. In fact, at the end of creation, in the book of Genesis, it, is, it says, God declared, it is very good. He was talking there about the whole of creation. But something goes terribly wrong. The first creatures think that they would be better off without God. And so they rebel against God and reject God in his ways. And then they hide from God. This is a deep inclination within us all. We are infinitely creative in inventing ways to hide from God. One popular way is to keep super busy so that we don't have time to concern ourselves with God. One of the hidden blessings of COVID-19 is that many of the activities that we fill our days with at this time of year have been taken from us. And we have more time to think and reflect and in the quiet to remember that we are a people in need. We are in need of help from outside. We are a people in need of a savior. As we hear the 11 lessons read, I pray that God may give us ears to recognize ourselves in the story and give ourselves wholly to the one who has, in the gift of Christmas, given himself to us for our own good and flourishing. Let us hear the word of the Lord. God powerfully creates all that is. A reading from Genesis. First this, God created the heavens and earth, all you see, all you don't see. Earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. God spoke, light, and light appeared. God saw that light was good and separated light from dark. God named the light day, he named the dark night. It was evening, it was morning, day one. God completes his act of creation by making human beings. A reading from Genesis. God spoke, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature, so they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of earth. God created human beings. He created them godlike, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. God bless them. Prosper, reproduce, fill earth, take charge. Be responsible for fish in the sea and birds in the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of earth. Then God said, I have given you every sort of seed-bearing plant on earth and every kind of fruit-bearing tree. Give them to you for food, to all animals and all birds, everything that moves and breathes. I give you whatever grows out of the ground for food. And there it was. God looked over everything he had made. It was so good, so very good. It was, the, it was evening, it was morning, day six. Adam and Eve, in a desire to live a life on their own terms, turned their back on God. They wanted God's knowledge without God. Their rejection of God has a very sad and dev devastating re results. A reading from Genesis. He told the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from that tree, that I commanded you not to eat from. Don't eat from this tree. The very ground is cursed because of you. Getting food from the ground will be as painful as having babies is for your wife. You'll be working in pain your, all your life long. The ground will sprout thorns and weeds. You'll get your food the hard way, planting and tilling and harvesting, sweating in the fields from dawn to dusk until you return to that ground yourself, dead and buried. You started out as dirt, you'll end up as dirt.
God is on a rescue mission. God takes it upon himself to form a community that will reflect his purposes and character to the world. A reading from Genesis. God told Abram, leave your country, your family, and your father's home for a land that I will show you. I'll make you a great nation and bless you. I'll make you famous. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. Those who curse you, I'll curse. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, just as God said, and Lot left with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot with him. Along all the possessions and people they had gotten in Haran, and set out for the land of Canaan and arrived safe and sound. Abram passed through the county as far as Shechem and the Oak of Moreh. At the time, the Canaanites occupied the land. The community that God formed was subject to sin and rebellion, just like the rest of humanity. God spoke his word to his people through people called prophets. Isaiah is one of them. Here, Isaiah tells of God's promise to send a child in the line of King David, who will rule the world. This is from the book Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. For those who lived in a land of deep shadows, light, sunbursts of light. You repopulated the nation, you expanded its joy. Oh, they're so glad in your presence. Festival joy. The joy of a great celebration, sharing rich gifts and warm greetings. The abuse of oppressors and cruelty of tyrants, all their whips and cudgels and curses, is gone, done away with a deliverance as surprising and as sudden as Gideon's old victory over Midian. The boots of all those invading troops, along with their shirts soaked with innocent blood, will be piled in a heap and burned, a fire that will burn for days. For a child has been born, for us, the gift of a son, for us. He'll take over the running of the, of the world. His name will be Amazing Counselor, Strong God, Eternal Father, Prince of Wholeness. His ruling authority will grow. And there will be no limits to the wholeness he brings. He'll rule from the historic David throne over that promised kingdom. He'll put the kingdom on a firm footing and keep it going with fair dealing and right living, beginning now and lasting always. The zeal of God of the angel armies will do all this. A descendant of King David will come to judge the world. This is good news because the purpose of his judgment is to set things right and establish his peace. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. A green shoot will sprout from Jesse's stump, from his roots a budding branch. The life-giving Spirit of God will hover over him, the Spirit that brings wisdom and understanding, the Spirit that gives direction and builds strength, the Spirit that instills knowledge and fear of God. Fear of God will be all his joy and delight. He won't judge by appearances. He won't judge on the basis of hearsay. He'll judge the needy by what is right, render decision on earth's poor with justice. His words will bring everyone to awed attention. A mere breath from his lips will topple the wicked. Each morning he'll pull on works, sturdy work clothes and boots and build righteousness and faithfulness in the land. The wolf will romp with the lamb, the leopard sleep with the kid, calf and lion will eat from the same trough, and a little child will tend them. Cow and bear will graze in the same pasture, their calves and cubs will grow up together, and the lion eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will crawl over rattlesnake dens. The toddler stick his hand down the hole of a serpent. Neither animal nor human will hurt or kill on my holy mountain. The whole earth will be brimming with knowing God alive, a living knowledge of God ocean deep, ocean wide.
For over 400 years, God's ancient people have not had a prophet to address them, but God has not forgotten his promise to send a king in the line of David. At this time, Israel is under Roman rule. God sends an angel to an unsuspecting peasant girl in an out-of-the-way place to announce his plans. A reading from the Gospel according to Luke. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to the Galilean village of Nazareth to a virgin engaged to be married to a man descended from David. His name was Joseph and the virgin's name Mary. Upon entering, Gabriel greeted her. Good morning, you are beautiful with God's beauty, beautiful inside and out. God be with you. She was thoroughly shaken, wondering what was behind a greeting like that. But the angel assured her, Mary, you have nothing to fear. God has a surprise for you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son and call his name Jesus. He will be great, be called son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will rule Jacob's house forever no end ever to his kingdom. Mary said to the angel, But how? I have never slept with a man. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the highest hover over you. Therefore the child you bring to birth will be called Holy Son of God. And did you know that your cousin Elizabeth conceived a son as old as she is? Everyone called her barren, and here she is, six months pregnant. Nothing you see is impossible with God. And Mary said, Yes, I see it all now. I am the Lord's maid, ready to serve. Let it be with me, just as you say. Then the angel left her. And then the time was right for the long-awaited Messiah to be born into the world. The promise made to Abraham was about to be fulfilled. A reading from the Gospel according to Luke. About that time, Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the empire. This was the first census when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone had to travel to his own ancestral hometown to be accounted for. So Joseph went from the Galilean town of Nazareth up to Bethlehem in Judah, David's town for the census. As a descendant of David, he had to go there. He went with Mary, his fiancée, who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the hostel.
While most people remained unaware of the birth of the Messiah, God ensured that members of the lowest classes of society became witnesses of it. The prophet Isaiah had said of the Savior who was to come, He will judge the needy with justice. He will give decisions for the poor of the earth. So the coming of the Messiah was made known among these people, the poor and the needy. Luke tells us. There were sheep herders camping in the neighborhood. They had set night watches over their sheep. Suddenly, God's angel stood among them and God's glory blazed around them. They were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A savior has just been born in David's town, a savior who is Messiah and master. This is what you're to look for, a baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. At once the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in the high heavenly heights, peace to all men and women on earth who please him. As the angel choir withdrew into heaven, the sheep herders talked it over. Let's get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. They left running and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. It came upon the midnight clear that glorious song of old from angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold peace on the earth good will to men from heaven's all gracious king the world in solemn still to hear the angels sing. Still through the cloven skies they come with peaceful wings unfurled. And still their heavenly music floats o'er all the weary world. Above it sounds The promise God gave to Abraham stated, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. The Messiah was not just for the people of Israel, but for everyone. As a confirmation of this truth, a group of foreigners came seeking the new king. Matthew tells us of their visit. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem village, uh, Judah territory, this was during Herod's kingship. A band of scholars arrived in Jerusalem from the east. They asked around, where can we find and pay homage to the newborn king of the Jews? We observed a star in the eastern sky that signaled his birth. We're on pilgrimage to worship him. When word of their inquiry got to Herod, he was terrified. And not Herod alone, but most of Jerusalem as well. Herod lost no time. He gathered all the high priests and religion scholars in the city together and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? They told him, Bethlehem, Judah territory. The prophet Micah told it plainly, It's you, Bethlehem, in Judah land. No longer bringing up the rear, from you will come the leader who will shepherd rule my people, my Israel. 
Herod then arranged a secret meeting with his scholars from the east. Pretending to be as devout as they were, he got them to tell them exactly when the birth announcement would, uh, star appeared. Then he told them the prophecy about Bethlehem and said, Go find this child, leave no stone unturned. As soon as you find him, send word and I'll join you at once in your worship. Instructed by the king, they sent off. Then the star appeared again, the same star they had seen in the eastern skies. It led them on until they hovered over the place of the child. They could hardly contain themselves. They were in the right place. They had arrived at the right time. They entered the house and saw the child in the arms of Mary, his mother. Overcome, they kneeled and worshipped him. Then they opened their luggage and presented gifts, gold, frankincense, and mirth. In a dream, they were warned not to report back to Herod, so they worked out another route, left the territory without being seen, and returned to their own country. According to the Bible, Jesus is not just a good man, 
or a smart man or a charismatic man, but he is what the theologians call the God man. It is a profound mystery that when Jesus came to earth, born as a baby, it was God himself who came to be with us and enter fully into this life so that he would take on and defeat the powers of sin and death and open up for us a brand new life. It is into this life, in the fellowship of the church, he calls each one of us today. A reading from the Gospel according to John. The Word was first, the Word present to God, God present to the Word. The Word was God, in readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through him. Nothing, not one thing, came into being without him. What came into existence was life, and the life was light to live by. The life light blazed out from the darkness. The darkness couldn't pull it out. There once was a man, his name John, sent by God to point out the way to the life light. He came to show everyone where to look, who to believe in. John was not himself the light. He was there to show the way to the light. The life light was the real thing. Every person entering life, he brings into light. He was in the world, the world was there through him, and yet the world didn't even notice. He came to his own people, but they didn't want him. But whoever did want him, who believed he was who he claimed, and would do what he said, he made to be their true selves, their child of God selves. These are the God-begotten, not blood begotten, not flesh begotten, not sex begotten. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. We'll come to our offertory prayer as I remind us uh, every Sunday that the offering is our response to God's wonderful, gracious uh, provision for all that we have and, and uh, for all that we need. And so, God of hope, renew in us the joy of your salvation and make us a living sacrifice to you for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We'll now have the intercessions. The response to each intercession is, Lord, have mercy. Watchful at all times, let us pray for strength to stand with confidence before our Maker and Redeemer, that God may bring in his kingdom with justice and mercy. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. That God may establish among the nations his scepter of righteousness, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. That we may seek Christ in the scriptures and recognize him in the breaking of the bread, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. That God may bind up the brokenhearted, restore the sick, and raise up all who have fallen. In a moment of quiet, we bring before God those on our hearts and minds at this time. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That the light of God's coming may dawn on all who live in darkness and in the shadow of death. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy, that with the saints in light we may shine forth as lights for the world. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. Let us commend the world which Christ will judge to the mercy and protection of God. Lord, we pray for a quick end to the coronavirus pandemic, for those infected and those who have been exposed. Grant them strength, healing, and protection. 
for their loved ones and caretakers. Grant them sound minds, courage, and humility. For physicians, nurses, technicians, researchers, administrators, and all other healthcare employees around the world, grant them strength by your life-giving spirit, wisdom, and resources to do the work before them. For those who must work despite the threat of sickness, grant them protection and continued provision. For those who have become unemployed or underemployed, grant them during this pandemic comfort, wisdom, and financial provision. For churches and their clergy, grant them discernment and creativity to lead and minister in unprecedented circumstances. For parents and families, grant them wisdom, patience, and joy. For children, grant them protection from fear. For those for whom home is not a safe haven, grant them refuge. For those who are alone, grant them a sense of your nearness and love. For all navigating decisions during this time of uncertainty and fear, grant them your peace. And for all the prayers we cannot voice because our language is insufficient or our ignorance too great, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. Amen. The Collect for this day, the fourth Sunday of Advent. Heavenly Father, who chose the Virgin Mary, full of grace, to be the mother of our Lord and Savior, now fill us with your grace, that we in all things may embrace your will and with her rejoice in your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. With joy in our hearts, let us gather our prayers in the words our Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. May the God of infinite goodness scatter the darkness of sin and brighten your hearts with holiness and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.
Let us go forth rejoicing to follow the light that has come into the world. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you everyone for joining with us today. Thank you for, uh, to all our singers and readers and musicians. Thank you to Linda for pulling all the music parts together. And uh, I pray that this time has been a blessing to you. Our services on Christmas Eve, well, we have one service here at 2 p.m. Of course, Omimi's service in person also is at 5 p.m. So, and you have to pre-register for the service here at 2, as well as on Christmas Day, 9.30 a.m. And, uh, and you have to pre-register for that, or register. And uh, so that's that. Oh, yes, and the Christmas Eve service will be released on our website, for viewing beginning at 7 p.m. Of course, you can watch it any time after that, but, uh, but it will be released at 7 p.m. Well, Christmas greetings and uh, wishes from our family to yours, and may you have a very Merry Christmas. <laughs>